You mean a woman can open it? Ah! A woman with a weak lady hand? Ah, am I right, Peter? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another episode of Business Blaze with I, your boy with a blaze. Also brought to you by Magic Spoon, Sam and Danny. Danny writes the script. Sam adds some memes. I read it. Magic Spoon, pay for it. Mmm. 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 Wow. That is delicious. Finally. Some good fucking food. Wow. How do you like this? Yeah, it's delicious. Well done. Wow. And you can pay Magic Spoon and get $5 off their delicious, magnificent cereal. And that's how the world goes round. Isn't capitalism beautiful? And Canadians, you can now also join in this capitalism fest because Magic Spoon now shipped to Canada. They don't ship to Europe yet, guys. And please stop hitting me up on Twitter. I'm not Magic Spoon. I just like their stuff and they happen to ship it to me so I can advertise it. But please, if you're going to go onto Twitter and ask me whether Magic Spoon is going to ship to Europe, I would ask you to redirect that towards Magic Spoon. Please, please leave me alone. What is so great about Magic Spoon? Well, let me tell you. Oh, yes. Mm. What is basically the case is you can see it right here on the box. Zero grams of sugar, mm -hmm. four grams of net carbs, and 13 grams of protein. And this, uh, for example, if you look on this one, the peanut butter one, you get 14 grams of protein. And the peanut butter one, as I've said before, is the finest of the fine. Also, each serving contains only 140 calories. It says right here in big red letters, Read nutritional values verbatim due to legal reasons. Done. Legal stuff locked in. Now let's talk about the glory. Look, we all loved cereal as children. We all loved it. We'd all come downstairs in the morning, get a bowl out, pour an absolutely giant bowl of what was my favorite, crunchy nut cornflakes, throw in an absolute ton of milk and munch that sh down and then pour another bowl. And then before you know it, you've consumed 2,700 calories. You feel like a piece of shit, but you're a kid. So you're just gonna burn it all off and not become a fat so, which is fantastic. What's great about Magic Spoon? No sugar. Look, no one likes sugar. Everyone loves sugar. Everyone loves sugar, but you know, you know that it's not good for you. You know that. Magic Spoon give you all of the delicious taste of that cereal you crave, and it's not gonna destroy your body. Brilliant. It's all of that. I think I've also got to say that it's, uh, what's that thing called? Keto. It's keto friendly for people who don't love carbs. Who does, I mean, look, everyone loves carbs. Cause it's like bread, Mwah. But the reality is let's eat less of them. Gluten free, grain free, soy free, low carb, GMO free. There's loads of flavors. What have I got here? Cocoa, frosted, peanut butter. Also, what's this? Magic Spoon limited edition birthday cake flavor in a special five pack with four other flavors. Holy shit, why didn't I have this Magic Spoon? The answer is because it was never gonna arrive on time for this ad spot to, to me in Europe, so they didn't send it to me, which is sad, because, I mean, it, what would they even taste like? Birthday cake comes in so many different flavors. Find out yourself through the link below. Last year was a huge hit, they're bringing it back. Make sure you get your hands on stuff before it sells out. Okie dokie, I wish I could get my hands on some of that Magic Spoon. Come on! Click the link below, get Magic Spoon cereal, build your very own variety box. Make sure you get the cinnamon, make sure you get the peanut butter, and you'll get $5 off if you use the code BLAZE. Again, $5 off if you use the magnificent code BLAZE! Now, mobile phone, go hither. Because if it's too close, then it, you might hear the when it's looking for signal. Shocking advertisements from yesteryear. <laughs> In like 50 years, people are gonna be like, that magic spoon ad. We used to have this thing called influence of marketing, where basically a hundred years of advertising principles just got thrown out of the window and somehow people still bought it. Take that! Sterling Keeper Draper Vice. I'm actually listening to a fantastic book right now by the guy who runs the o Oglivy or Ogilvy's or whatever it's called, that giant advertising agency. And it's fascinating. It's called like alchemy or something. And it's like all about why people do things when it's completely illogical. And I'm like a super right brain, logical, like, you know, I, I don't like, I I'm just logical. And this book is like why people aren't logical. And I'm like, it's a great book. If I was doing an advert for either Blinkist or um, Audible or one of these guys, I'd be like, oh, check that out. It's fantastic. For the last few weeks, I've been, oh my God, we're finally here. Danny's introduction after Simon's introduction after the introductory ad read. Ah!
For the last few weeks, I've been chewing over the best way to market my new basement brew that I've been secretly manufacturing in the middle of the night when everyone else has gone to sleep. I'll admit that it's not the perfect brew as my resources are a bit limited. Danny, you have any resources in there? Are you making it out of rats again, Danny? Cool. This coffee smells like shit. It is shit, Austin. I like to describe it as salty and hoppy and a yeasty concoction infused with mild autumn breeze, a light fragrance of bird nest, and a half-forgotten memory of a fishing trip which involved a surprising downpour of rain. Danny, you can't make food with your thoughts. We've talked about this! In truth, it's probably more like trying to eat- By the way, this is absolutely enormous. It's like 15 pages, but apparently a lot of it's just images. Because Danny loves wasting my printer ink. He's like, Simon, you could resize the images. And I'm like, Danny, have you met me? No, he hasn't actually. But I mean, he has, <laughs> he's watched the business pages. You know that I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you just know it. In truth, it's probably more like trying to eat a bonfire and I don't have access to proper glass bottles. So I had to make do with plastic baby feeding bottles. But I think that gives the basement brew a visually distinctive edge. And it's about 68% alcohol too. So not many customers will care too much after the first few sips. God damn, I got a whiskey at home that's 60% alcohol. And the big difference between that uh, 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 and uh, you know a regular whiskey like 40 to 45 percent it's extraordinary like you taste it. it has like a different experience in your mouth like it feels like it evaporates more or something it's quite delicious mm, that's a 10. however i'm now feeling con a concern that the print campaign might have run into a few problems. In the end, I went with a photograph of a drunk baby guzzling down another bottle of basement brew while wearing a bib with the slogan, Fuck the police, and a flickering V sign at the viewer alongside the caption, Dare to be different, only losers drink responsibly. <laughs> ah yes, the drink responsibly advertising campaign. The best thing about drinking is irresponsibility. This kind of thing would probably have barely even raised an eyebrow back in the glory days of boldly creative advertising, but people get so angsty about the slightest detail these days. You don't have to go back very far in time to see that all print advertisements uh, that might provoke a painful wince or a tut of disapproval in this allegedly more enlightened era. Stuff that may have been deemed perfectly acceptable even just the last decade might not necessarily fly in 2021. But when you bravely venture even back further into the realm of truly vintage advertisements, you begin to uncover the kind of material that seems positively batshit today. Is it always illegal to kill a woman? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> At first I thought this was one of those weirder questions that you usually find on Cora. You know the kind of thing. Can a baby get pregnant if you have sex during pregnancy? This is like, this I feel is more Yahoo Answers rather than uh, Cora. During airplane turbulence, how do atheists keep calm? What if time suddenly stopped for five seconds? Is listening to jazz communism? Do they have toilet paper in Canada? I don't believe these are real, but I also entirely believe that they are. It's like the Schrodinger's cat of Cora questions. But no, the question, is it always illegal to kill a woman was a thought-provoking brain teaser slapped on the top of this Pitney Bowles ad from 1947. And I have it printed for me, Sam. The strangest point of all is that this was an advertisement for the company's new easy-to-use postage meter. What? And it's difficult to see exactly why they chose to go in such a bizarre direction. The ad copy tells the surprisingly long-winded story of a disheveled businessman called Pete Jones who buys one of his female employees this new efficient and time-saving print stamp printing device to help speed up her mailing duties without the need to spend half the day licking stamps. Oh, Peter, you hero! It's like, look, woman. I got you something for menial tasks. Praise me. In his own words, it's practically heaven's gift to the working girl. Oh my. But Miss Morrissey, or that redhead Morrissey as Pete describes her. Oh my gosh. This wouldn't even be appropriate in Mad Men. When is this? 47. As Pete describes her, is having none of it and snootily turns her nose up at the idea of progress and efficiency. Efficiency. She explains that she has no mechanical aptitude and the machines mix her up. Of course, because she's a simple brained woman. A man could handle this job with no problem. But she eventually agrees to a two week trial period of this clever new machine. Cleverer than her. Am I right, Peter? Am I right? Daddy, chill. And after that, she's singing a very different tune. She's so impressed with the Pitney Bowles posted meter that she even put a pretty pink bow on it and she explains now the mail is out early enough so i get to go to the girls room in time to hear all of the dirt because all women do is gossip in the bathroom 
Well done, Pitney Boat. We can't criticize them too much. It was 1947. It was a different time. Time that we should all be glad we're not living in anymore. And this is apparently what prompts an exasperated Pete Jones to consider the legal technicalities. It gets worse, of course, because this entry is titled, Is it ever legal to kill a woman? Pete Jones considers the legal technicalities of murdering women as all the co-workers look on and smile in the background. There must be a more straightforward way to market the benefits of a postage meter without resorting to an office murder plot involving a man who, ha who was far-sighted and generous enough to buy a smart new machine for his ungrateful and incompetent female employee who is clearly frightened by anything more technical than a stapler and is motivated entirely by office gossip. So any woman, am I right, Peter? Am I right? No. I dread to think how Miss Morrissey would have coped in later years with the arrival of, say, the fax machine, assuming she was still alive by then. Oh, God. Pears Soap. Still going strong today, Pears Soap was first launched in London, way back in 1807, as the world's very first translucent soap. I always thought of it as quite a posh soap. It looked a bit like a bar of gold, and it has... It had a loving fragrance to match even that of Rotting Turtle, a fragrance for men, available at RottingTurtle.com, although possibly not yet. Maybe there'll be a page there where you can enter your email address to learn about the arrival of my fragrance for men, Rotting Turtle. And I believe we'll be having a fragrance for women called Rotting Badger. You're welcome, ladies! Everything on that page for the ladies will be in simple English, <laughs> so that you women can understand it. Am I right, Pizza? No. I never found Pear's soap to be particularly heavy, but maybe it was heavier than I could ever have imagined, because according to an advertisement published in 1899, Pear's soap wasn't just any kind of soap. It was the white man's burden. Okie dokie. <laughs> the first step towards lightening the white man's burden is through touching, teaching the virtues of cleanliness. Pear's soap. What is he talking about? What is the white man's burden? Is it... I, uh, should I have heard of that? It's a potent factor in brightening the dark corners of the earth as civilization advances whilst among the cultured of all nations it holds the highest place. It's the ideal toilet soap. Wait, wait, wait. So is Pears essentially saying, like, anywhere that isn't one of the colonial powers is really dirty and we need to ship soap there to clean us up? Dude, the past. F*** it. It's hard to know if the company was really trying to flog a few bars of soap here or there, or if they were blowing their marketing budget on making a dramatic political statement. But this ad seems to imply that colonialism is perfectly legitimate because the white rulers were bringing civilization and cleanliness to all the savage barbarians they encountered and conquered on their travels by introducing the natives to soap and telling them to get a good wash. Ah! No! The small print of the ad reads, the first step towards lightening the white man's burden is through teaching... I'd already read that to the dark corners of the earth. Yes, yes, yes. If you squint through the portal of the ship in the picture, you could just about make out a beach scene in which a black man is on his knees before a white visitor begging to, begging to be given the gift of a... Oh no, it's totally there! No, Pess! <laughs> What have you done? And those advert leaves a nasty, lingering fragrance of British imperialism in the air. It was hardly a one-off for Pears Soap. They had a long-running period of producing adverts rooted in racism and bigotry throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. This advert from 1894 may be one of the worst offenders. Okay, so it's a white baby washing a black baby. Uh... It appears to depict a young white boy giving a bath to a young black boy with the aid of Pears Soap alongside a caption which reveals that the product is matchless for the hands and complexion. Oh no, the black kids turned white! Oh no! Guys, 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 guys. I didn't even notice that. I was like, what's wrong with this? And then it's very clear what is wrong with this. It certainly seems to have quite a startling effect as it appears as if the white boy is actually scrubbing away the blackness of the boy in the bathtub who looks jolly pleased, or perhaps slightly surprised by this unexpected turn of events. Again, it seems to imply that white people can help posh wash away the perceived unrefined natures of these foreign savages and help them look and feel a bit more English. <laughs> ah, so uncomfortable. Not quite sure why it didn't work on the back black child's head though. Maybe the marketing team thought that this might be crossing a line. You really had to be careful not to offend anyone back in those days of political correctness gone mad. The past was the worst, don't forget it. You mean a woman can open it? Aha, am I right, Peter? A quick search on Google reveals that Del Monte usually copped the blame for this advert from 1953, and that's probably because you can flatantly see something resembling the Del Monte logo on the bottle of ketchup or pig's blood or whatever it is. Sam! Ba -da -ba 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 -da. You mean a woman can open it? Ah! A woman with a weak lady hands? Am I right, Peter? But to be fair to Del Monte, they had nothing to do with this sh 
show. The advert who isn't promoting a new ketchup is promoting this fancy new twist-off bottle cap produced by the Alcoa Aluminium Company. It comes with new special grooves which make the process of removing the cap so breathtakingly easy that even a woman can do it. You're breathtaking! The ad even underlines the word woman just to make sure that you understand the incredible point that the, you're making. I guess the advert was targeted towards women. Because any man could, even with the without the underscored woman, a man would be able to understand. Clearly underlined for the benefit of women. Am I right, Peter? The uh, accompanying ad goes, ad copy goes on to explain how the new bottle cap can be removed easily without a knife, blade, bottle opener, or even a husband. But a bum bum. So that's good news for single women who were previously facing the gloomy prospect of life without ketchup unless they could find a strong husband to come and rescue them from such depravity and also lift them up to a higher moral standing and make them complete. Am I? I'm gonna stop. Thank you! The ad had attracted some surprisingly detailed analysis over the years, including some critics who were maybe digging a little too deep into the subtext when they highlight the alleged sexual connotation within the image, suggesting that the ketchup bottle is a penis and the woman is clearly gagging for Stop it! This is like, uh, although I guess this is actually, I don't know if it's true, but you know like when you're in school, and, I don't know, either theatre or English, and you're doing, like, you're reading a book from, like, the 18th century. And, like, don't forget to read between the lines. What is the author trying to say about the, uh, relationship between character A and character B? And you're like, well, they're married. And it's like, no, no, no. Between the lines, it's like, oh, well, they have a deep underlying tension related to- What are you talking about? It's like, they just don't like each other anymore. That's okay. I don't think we need to go that far. It's just an ad which demonstrates the sexist stereotypes of the 1950s by clearly marking out women as the weaker sect as they are. Am I might- Including even removing a bottle cap without manly assistance. Funnily enough, I seem to be finding it increasingly difficult to open bottles and cans and jars myself these days, so I might have been a bit more appropriate face for the Alcoa aluminium twist-off bottle cap. But I'm convinced that I'm the victim of a government conspiracy to make things harder to open in a bid to reduce citizens to a state of powerless submission. I'm so thirsty, I have to get a drink. Po Chon Prodig. Prod- I don't know how to pronounce that, but I'm not gonna look it up. Prodigy. Prodig. Prodig, Kachon Prodig. Pig appears to hog quite an unusual pedestal in marketing. On the whole, you don't tend to see meat products packaged with striking visuals of the dead animal that you're about to eat. But when you're buying a Big Mac from McDonald's, the paper wrapping doesn't come emblazoned with pictures, pictures of slaughtered cows hanging from hooks. But it seems to be more acceptable if the dead animal happens to be a pig. I can remember buying packages of pork scratchings in the UK, which featured a jolly pig in a butcher's hat on the front, giving a cheeky wink to the customer. It's like, eat me, come on. Come on. But even that wasn't quite as bad as this disturbingly graphic image produced by Kachon Pet Pro Prodig Sausages way back in 1919. Oh god. <laughs> Sam, there you go. I mean, come on. Oh, it's French. He's like, so <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> I mean, it's it's less inappropriate, it's more just weird. French advertisement was persuading customers to explore the benefits of free-range pork, sourced from happy pigs raised in an unfenced environment with plenty of access to the glorious outdoors. The caption on the poster translates as, We eat with pleasure and without fatigue the good sausages of the prodigious pig. Oh my gosh. And then to really ram the point home, we see the joyful pig happily carving itself into tasty slices with a massive knife. It's not a million miles away from the Amaglian Major Cow from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Galaxy, the animal which is purposefully bred with a burning and persuasive desire to appear on the restaurant menu. But I'm not convinced that the image of a self mutilating pig really tells the full story of how these French porky sausages are really produced, and I can't help but find it just a tad off putting. I'll go for the green salad. Yes. Super weird. Smoking Santa. We can't make a video on our dated advertisements without pausing to light up a strand and reflect on the changing attitudes of acceptable tobacco marketing. As we've mentioned in previous videos, doctors were often queuing up to easily recommend the healthiest brand, while apparently the dentist's choice of cigarette was always Viceroy's. <laughs> Dentists like recommending cigarettes. Although I remember like my parents or my grandparents would say when they used to go to the doctor, it's like the doctor, you know, you'd be like, so, what can I do for you? Cigarette? It's like, you're the doctor. And the doctor's just sitting there smoking, offering a cigarette to the men only. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Lucky Strikes once went with, Lighter Lucky and you'll never miss sweets that make you f- Well, Chesterfield cigarettes were apparently just as pure as the water you drink, except for all the cancer inside them. Do I have to say allegedly there? <laughs> allegedly? Uh, I mean, there's not literally cancer inside a cigarette. 
there's just loads of things that cause cancer. So I'm so glad I gave up drinking water years ago. It did me a world of good. But it turns out even Santa Claus liked smoking like a chimney. And here we go. Oh, wow. Oh, it's like a, it's it's not just even incidental. Like Santa happens to be smoking and advertising something else. It's no Santa is advertising cigarettes. Brilliant. Luckies are easier on my throat. Santa, you see. I smoke Marlboro Red because it's rough on my throat. In 1936, Santa was chosen by the American Tobacco Company to become the latest surprising celebrity endorsement to feature on their new marketing campaigns for Lucky Strikes. The fat bloke from the North Pole was happy to declare that Luckies are easier on the throat and can even help protect it from irritation and coughing. Well, thanks for that beautifully wrapped gift of public information, Santa. I'm surprised they didn't go with something like, kids who smoke Lockies always avoid the naughty list. Yes, we shouldn't be using like images of Santa, like smoke. It I mean, this is clearly going to be getting kids. Come on. It's just difficult to see why the American Tobacco Company would choose a fictional character beloved by naive children to help promote their cancer sticks. This, they might as well have chosen characters from a popular animated TV series to bang on about the benefits of smoking in a series of TV commercials. And about three decades later, Winston Cigarettes did just that. <laughs> no. Oh, the early seats of the Flintstones aired during the 1960s uh, were sponsored by Winston Cigarettes. So the ad breaks and sometimes even the climax of an episode often depicted Fred and Barney Rubble enjoying a sneaky smoke in the back garden while leaving all the housework to Wilma and Betty. <laughs> this is amazingly bad. And you can't blame them for choosing a Winston. After all, Winston tastes like a good cigarette should. To be fair, the Flintstones had originally been conceived, been conceived as an animated sitcom rather than a cartoon exclusively for kids, but it naturally picked up a devoted following amongst youngsters along the way. It wasn't until 1963 and the birth of Pebbles Flintstone that the producers decided Winston cigarettes perhaps wasn't the most appropriate sponsor of the show, and they picked up an alternative sponsorship from Welch's Foods. I don't know what Welch's, uh, do they make that grape juice? Or like, do Welch's make, or jelly, or some like that? Oh, or as the Americans would call it, Jello. Perhaps the most disturbing tobacco advertisement of all time was a print ad for Marlboro, which ran in Cosmopolitan magazine in the 1950s. I don't know what this is. It's going to be good. Like, dis most disturbing cigarette advertisement ever. I'm waiting to be surprised, Danny. Oh, it features a baby. <laughs> ah, come on. Before, Sam. Before you scold me, mum, maybe you better light up a Marlboro. Gee, mummy, you sure enjoy your Marlboro. Yes, you never need, ne never feel oversmoked. That's the miracle of Marlboro. <laughs> guys, come on. This depicts a young baby pleading with his mum to light up a Marlboro before scolding him, and it seems to indicate the young children are less likely to be brutally beaten if their dangerously overstressed mothers just take a second to calm the f*** down and light up a Marlboro. Mommy, chill. And the really good news is that you can puff away on as many of them as you like without fear of getting oversmoked. <laughs> Whatever the f*** that is. That's the miracle of Marlboro. It's unfortunate that the young baby is likely to get smothered in secondhand smoke from a very early age, but at least his mummy seems happier now. And with a bit of luck, he'll survive until at least the following Christmas. <laughs> oh my god, Danny, dark. If only Santa Claus hadn't died of lung cancer, that was such a drag. Have some fun. Beat your wife tonight. Oh, good lord, could it get any worse? Yes, Sam, boom! Finally, just very briefly illustrate how we don't always have to travel that far back in time to an era of distasteful advertising. This ad was cheerfully printed in newspapers and magazines as recently as the early 1970s. Danny, I don't know what makes you think that the early 1970s was recently. It was nearly, it was half a century ago. <laughs> have some fun, beat your wife tonight. <laughs> oh my God, good Lord. It's actually promoting a BPA fun center in Michigan and the rib crushing joke behind the ad is that it's encouraging customers to beat your partner in a fun game of bowling rather than hit your wife over the head with a sledgehammer. Still not appropriate. It was hailed in some quarters at the time for daring to challenge the expectation of an audience of capturing attention with subversive and out-of-context headlines. But poking fun at domestic violence is unlikely to win any awards for marketing creativity today. I think it would be more likely to throw out the question, is it always illegal to kill an insensitive copywriter? Yes, Danny, it is. This video is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Yes! magic spoon and uh you get five dollars off by using the code blaze there is a link below also if you'd like some merch perch the uh also oh 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 i got a subreddit reddit.com forward slash r forward slash simon wishler and you can go there and join the legends there's five thousand of the legends now suggesting things talking about stuff making fun of me all of that jolly good stuff and i will see you next time
Are you making it out of rats again, Danny? 